So I said yes to everything. Uh, if there was a small contract, a big contract, someone I knew, somebody I didn't know, I was so nervous that I wouldn't have, uh, you know, a, a stream of partners that I said yes to everything. And that put me in some spaces that uh, I didn't necessarily know everything that I was doing, but I learned uh, and I studied and I tried to be responsive to what people asked. Welcome to the No Excuse Pro Podcast, your weekly dose of motivation and actionable advice. If you're a realtor, financial planner, business owner, or anyone who's tired of making excuses and ready to take your success to the next level, you've come to the right place. Join your host, Kevin Briarton, each week as he chats with industry leaders who are going beyond the excuses to achieve their goals. So no excuses accepted. Let's get started. Hey, Ian, thanks so much for joining me on the No Excuse Pro podcast, where we're helping people break through through excuses and uh, achieve their goals. So thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate you having having you on and uh, tell everybody a little bit about what you do and and why you do it. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, for inviting me to this space. I'm happy to be with you having this conversation. Uh, My name is Ian Escobel. I'm born and reared in New Mexico, and I have the good fortune to be a coach and a consultant and a facilitator. And I think a lot of my work really boils down to being a listener. I'm someone who grew up around a wooden kitchen table in a more rural community uh, where my parents conducted impromptu Socratic seminars. Uh, And so my sister and I were fortunate to learn with and from my parents, learn with and from other family members who joined us. But as the youngest in my family, uh, I really had to pay attention and listen. So I, I'm grateful to my family for giving me that skill that I bring to my professional spaces. That's awesome. Well, I think listening is definitely easy to overlook. So I consistently work on being a better listener every day, um, yeah. per- personally and professionally. Uh, my wife says that I, 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 told, I always say I can hear, but I have listening issues, you know? And so I, I, it's something I'm, always, well, I'm aware of and working on. Like we, everybody needs to be continually working on this. Mm-hmm. Even if you think you're, you, you are the best listener, uh, you probably have some areas to grow. So just curious, like what's the one thing that stand out, uh, has ma- that has made you successful over the we- years? What's the one thing? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know if I've been successful over all of the years, to be honest, but I'll say the recent success I've had. I think has come from me doing work that aligns with my values. I started my coaching business in 2018, and that was a shift from working in the nonprofit space to having a small business that I could continue to support nonprofit work and government work, uh, but to do so with more autonomy. And I felt like when I was able to do that, I was really representing myself and not necessarily my board members uh, or the organization at large. And so I could take some different risks and I could be a little more outspoken than when I felt like I was representing an entity and folks um, that I wanted to do right by. And so I think finding work that aligns with who I am, uh, I I believe it's my vocation. Um, And it also allows me to do really exciting work with really great people. Um, So the path is, is open and I can be modular and I can work with different people doing different things. So there's a little bit of, um, some nervousness, right? Will I have work next year? What's the long-term plan? Will I continue to find partnerships? But I've been incredibly lucky that through word of mouth, um, I continue to have good work and good opportunities. So as starting that business in 2018, what, what's mm-hmm. been like your biz- biggest obstacle when you started jumping into kind of a new world of yeah. uh, personal growth? So I said yes to everything. Uh, if there was a small contract, a big contract, someone I knew, somebody I didn't know, I was so nervous that I wouldn't have, uh, you know, a, a stream of partners that I said yes to everything. And that put me in some spaces that uh, I didn't necessarily know everything that I was doing, but I learned uh, and I studied and I tried to be responsive to what people asked. And so now I find myself in a position where I'm fortunate enough and privileged enough to be able to say no, which is also pretty hard because there's so much good work out there that I want to do, but I'm mindful of my family. I'm mindful of, uh, I have a nine-year-old daughter, six-year-old son. My wife and I um, want to spend a lot of time with our kids. And I know that working can sometimes take away from that time with my family. And I'm somebody who values 
family happiness is one of my core values. And so I want to live by that and not overextend myself for some, uh, you know, profit goal I might have or some sort of expansion goal. Uh, I'm really trying to work on defining enough for myself. And that's both in my business and with my family. So are there any tools that can help you with saying no um, or putting up barriers to allow you to not have to, wait? let's say you've already determined that you don't want to work after five o'clock or you don't want to work on Sundays. Is there any way or any tools that you've built to make sure you put up barriers to make sure you don't accidentally say yes to something that you should have, you've already pre-planned that you, sh- you will say no to? Kevin, I'm a, I'm a work in progress. So I wish I could tell you I've done that and I've stuck by it and it's been flawless, but that's not, not true. Um, I remind myself that saying no to one thing enables me to say yes to something else. And so in my mind, I will often say, saying no to this email, saying no to doing this project on Sunday allows me to say yes to being present with my family or, or yes to doing something different. Do I always do that? No. There are moments when there's a deliverable that's outstanding. And for my peace of mind, I'll do a little bit extra work. Um, yeah. And I find that makes me better when I do engage with my family and other folks. So I'm not stressed and I'm not, you know, my body might be present with my family, but my mind is thinking about how am I going to write this? And I need to get that thing sent by this time. So I just find it better to focus on that work, get it off my plate. So then I can be present both with my mind and my body with my family. Yeah. Well, something that I've done is, you know, really use utilizing the do not disturb on my phone and mm-hmm. it presetting it. So mm-hmm. it's do not disturb. There's also a really cool email app. Um, that I really embraced. It's called it's Boomerang. And I think there's a couple different Boomerang companies, but Boomerang for email, it is amazing because what it does is it auto blocks certain emails at certain times. Hmm. And so it doesn't block it. It actually puts it into a separate folder automatically. So they cool. call it on pause. Okay. And the reason why that's important is sometimes you need to send an email, but you don't always want to see all your other emails that you need to deal with because you've batched the time to do it at a specific time. So Boomerang allows you that time to have a clear inbox. If you're like me and a lot of uh, successful professionals like to have a clear inbox. Um, and if you're, especially if you're detailed and you want to get things done and, uh, but, but you'll never have a clean inbox ever pretty much because you continue to get emails, Right. So those are two things that I've done that have really helped me. And if anybody's listening or you, that, you know, that's something that uh, two systems that I just embrace. If you say you're not working after eight o'clock or whatever the timeline is, usually there's an end of the day and then there's the real end of the day. So there's usually that window where it's like, okay, if I get an email or call at 536, it's urgent, I might handle it. But if it's after 830, I'm in bed, I'm done, you know, I'm done, done, right? So... I think there's it's uh it's important to think through those. I love the idea of saying no to more or saying yes to less things. However you want to look at it, what I would recommend there, uh, and you probably have done this, but have you ever done a not to do list? I've heard of it. One of the best things I've ever done. Yeah. It it sounds crazy, and you know it's it's like well yeah like. But really sitting down to think about stuff you do all the time that yeah. you probably shouldn't be doing and you put it on your not to-do list and you build things around it. I'll give you an example. I used to love going to my closings. I mm-hmm. And I'm in the mortgage business. I always enjoyed and I pride myself on, I go to every single closing. That's how I was trained when I first started in the early 2000s. The issue though was it was in conflict of my bigger picture goals, helping more people, helping more partners, And also helping being there for my family. Mm -hmm. If I spend two hours driving to a closing that I've already prepped for, I don't need to be there. I'm just there to give a high five and make them feel warm and fuzzy and then take off. That kills two hours out of my day. So is that in line with what my purpose is and my goal is? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. And I, I made this decision nine years ago and it was a game changer in my life. And so I would highly recommend you know, thinking through a not to do list, anybody listening, the not to do list is, is very simple. You just put down 
ideas of stuff you're doing right now that you can save time on that it's not in line with your goal. And it might be something really good to do. Like it might be something like as, as great as taking your kids to school, right? Taking your kids to school can sound great, but does that impact maybe getting to their sports games on time because you have to do work when you could have gone to the work office a little bit earlier. Maybe you take your kids two days a week rather than uh, five days a week. Something like that could be on the not to do list. So uh, any thoughts on that at all? I get curious, Kevin, how often do you do your not to do list? Um, so that's a great question. So I did one about nine, nine years ago. And then I have relooked at it probably um, every three, four years. Yeah. Um, I'm actually in the working on doing a big revamp on my goals and mm. uh, vision look, you know, look out, outward looking. I think uh, we have to keep, you know, the goals front and center and, ex- and the excitement around it because that's, mm-hmm. that's pulling us forward. Um, I, I need to be pulled forward with different visions and, and different ideas and goals. Now, that's, I believe the not to do list is empty without the goals. Because mm-hmm. if you don't look at your goals, then you don't know what the direction is. Then you just keep doing the thing you shouldn't be doing. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the things that I've been looking at is, you know, making sure my diet's right. And the diet makes you makes you feel better, which in return gives you more energy to be around for your family and your clients. And if I can get my diet right and feel just a little bit better, may, you know, and there's a saying in, in leadership, eat only what you need to, you know, that's going to give you energy um, mm-hmm. and no more. You don't need to keep eating. If there's, we a lot of times overeat and that'll mm-hmm. slow us down. Um, so I, I think that's that's getting into my not to do list a little bit. So I'm actually working on that right now. I would say uh, once a year is fine if you're doing your goals every year. If, if you're somebody that does that, or at least every every other year. And I like what you said uh, about the eating piece. Also, as you were talking, I thought about the speed of movement. Right. And when we release things, when we set things down, when we say, I'm not going to carry this, we can probably move mm-hmm. faster. We could maybe run longer, mm-hmm. right? When we're not holding on to all of those pieces. So, uh, some of the work I do is around mm-hmm. freedom and liberation and how do you release things? How do you unburden yourself with things? Mm-hmm. There's a lot that we carry in our heart. There's a lot that we carry in our mind, uh, that we can let go of. And so I hear part of that in your not to do list, which I love. Um, I think consciously and unconsciously, so many of us are carrying around things that don't serve us. And so part of that not to do list is about releasing those things. So one thing that uh, I'm studying right now is Jim Rohn, great leader in, uh, in leadership and personal growth and goal setting. And he talks about one of the greatest unhappiness comes from within. Mm-hmm. One of the greatest sources of unhappiness comes from within. So sometimes we can feel guilty about something that maybe somebody else forgot about years ago. Um, you know, for example, my daughter just, uh, we went on vacation and um, I got a little, we got a little rushed at the end because she was trying to pick out a, a sweatshirt and we didn't try it on. Right. And I was like, just, just get it. We got to go, you know, let's wrap it up. Like been here forever, you know, and she gets a really cute sweatshirt. She picks out a cool thing to put on it. And she put the actually make the sweatshirt in the store and we drive three hours away and she tries it on and it's too small. Okay. And then I'm thinking, ah, that's fine. You know, she'll wear it for like a year or two. Who cares? You know, but she was like devastated. Well, my wife goes back to our friend that's still in, in where we came from. She was, they were still there for a few more days. She has them go back to the store, get the same sweatshirt in a larger size and surprise my daughter with it, our daughter with it. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. My wife did that. Then I'm my the other flip side of it, I'm feeling guilty and unhappy with myself that I didn't think about that, right? And that's just an example that just happened. And sometimes like these little things eat away at our happiness and letting them go is a little harder uh, than obviously than, uh, than it sounds. Are there any tools or any practices that you recommend on letting go uh, maybe some of these things that are stopping us, uh, maybe they're excuses. Um, do you see them being excuses? Do you see how, how do you let these excuses go and these things that are holding us back? Yeah. Uh, as you were sharing, part of what I heard is how prominent the inner critic, uh, that inner voice 
can be in our life. So um, a lot of my work in coaching is around getting in touch with our inner voices, right? And what are the messages that are being shared in your mind that you uh, can shift or change or adjust, right? As soon as you acknowledge that that voice that's telling you, Kevin, you should have gone back and got the smaller sweatshirt, isn't necessarily you, right? That's one of the thoughts flowing through your body. Another thought could be, you know what? You're a good dad. Uh, and you were trying to move your family onto something else that was important and give yourself a little grace. Um, you love your daughter. She knows that it, it was a material thing and you'll have other opportunities to show her how you show up. That's a very different internal dialogue compared to, boy, you really screwed that up. And I think it's unfortunate how often we hear those voices that criticize us. So what are those inner voices that compliment us or see our gifts and see our strengths? Uh, one way that folks can do that is through journaling, right? Anytime you have an inner dialogue that's negative, uh, put all that on paper. And then what would a flip of that narrative be, right? What would a reframing of an experience, of a behavior, of an action look like? Another way to think about it is, how would you talk with your best friend about what just happened? Um, and if you're the kind of friend who shows up with love and support, my hope is someone would say, again, Kevin, you're a good dad. I've seen how much you and your daughter love each other, connect with each other. This was one example, but there is a plethora of examples about how you show up and do good work. That feels a little bit different. Maybe you got some friends who also give you a hard time. Boy, you really messed that one up. Uh, but I hope that teasing comes with some love and an acknowledgement of bigger picture. Who are you in your daughter's life compared to the one opportunity that you missed to be responsive to her needs with the sweatshirt? Yeah, I think the reframing is awesome. One of the reframes, and to your point, it's something to be aware of because we're never going to be perfect. No matter how much we try, no matter who we are, what we're doing, uh, it, is, it just is what it is. Because perfect is a subjective view on what could have happened, what it should have happened, and what we did do. But the the interesting thing to frame this a little bit in the finance world is one thing that, um, you know, um, is a reframe is paying down debt. And mm -hmm. some people are like, Oh my gosh, I have so much debt. I have so much credit card debt. I just want to like, but reframing it and going, Hey, I'm super excited. I paid down the credit card and I increased my, my assets and reduced my liabilities. I'm so excited that I was able to do that mm -hmm. where you could be upset. because like, well, I don't have as much money to go and do whatever. Right. I don't, I want to, I mean, you, you know, I feel guilty about my credit card debt. And then, but it's reframing and being excited about the opportunity that's the flip of the opportunity that you're feeling negative with. Mm -hmm. And it is some work that I'm doing around that. Now, what are two, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. I'm going to try to keep this on drive time. And man, I can talk to you forever. So I seriously, like, I think we got to do another one of these down the road. And I, I think this is awesome. So um, what are two tools right now or two two things that um, our technology that you're using that you think, man, if it weren't for these two things, um, um, I wouldn't be able to do what I do uh, today? Yeah, good question. Um, I actually think about um, how, I'm, how am I releasing, going back to the things that we release? How do I release some technologies to go back to how I think humans are fundamentally designed? Uh, so I spend a lot of time looking at my phone. And when I'm looking at my phone, I'm not looking at my children's eyes or my partner's eyes. And so one practice is to be thoughtful and conscious, like you have mentioned, putting the phone down or moving away from uh, any sort of electronics to be face to face. I also do some work, Kevin, uh, in circles. And so to me, that feels like a type of technology, something that people have known about in many cultures for thousands of years. Uh, when we show up, and we meet each other uh, in circle space. There isn't um, one person at the head of the meeting, right? Everybody is a leader in that space. Circle work really focuses on listening. It focuses on storytelling. It focuses on receiving people's energy, who they are, where they are, what they're doing. Um, and it also quiets that critic voice. It's not about criticism and planning on what you're gonna say next to shoot that person's point down. It's about empathy and compassion and understanding where other people are coming from. So I mentioned that in this frame of technology because I know AI is with us and is gonna change everything about us. I know there's apps and there's programs and there's things that can lead to our 
efficacy um, and our efficiency. And I guess I would encourage all your listeners to also think about how are you slowing down? And instead of moving faster with the um, support of machines, how are you moving slower in relationship with humans? How are you seeing people and hearing people and being present for people and deepening relationships um, so you can give yourself that medicine? Unfortunately, I've read so many articles recently about how loneliness is yeah. literally killing people, especially men. Well, and I, I mean, I, the- I can contribute to that right now. I mean, I so we we moved our whole industry and a lot of industries really moved very remote. Um, our processors, our underwriters probably are more efficient, uh, maybe remote. Uh, salespeople, though, just just by cutting costs and our industry and the mortgage industry um, cut costs and they got rid of a lot of office spaces. Um, I have an office space, but it's just me in the office, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and I fought it for a while. And I, and the reality is that it's just a new reality. So we actually have a topic in um, our, our group that I'm part of to try to figure out how to do this. And I love the idea of this circle like talk. So I'm actually on all, I'm a couple hours out to go meet up uh, a couple branches in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, just watch twisters. So hopefully there's no twisters coming for us. Um, but I'm super excited about it because I am craving interaction. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, like how to describe it, but I definitely have an emptiness in what I'm doing. And that's why I love doing the uh, podcast because I need to talk to people. And sometimes, you know, you get together with your friends and you don't really talk about this stuff, you know, always. And I enjoy personal growth and I enjoy it for the right reasons. And it has made a big change in my life. Um, I got introduced to personal growth and uh, in 2007 and, and just made a huge difference in my life and direction in my life. And, and I think that there's opportunity. The, um, the loneliness, though, is hard to, I guess, easy thing to uh, solve, but hard to solve at the same time. What would you recommend for offices and businesses and people that are remote? I have I have realtors that are working remote in the same city and they're remote. Yeah. Um, what would you recommend the best way to help this your problem, right? Yeah. Um, I can't speak to the, here's what's going to fix it for everybody, but I'll let you know what's helped me. Uh, when I was a single member LLC and doing kind of sole proprietor work, uh, there was a um, shared office space here in Albuquerque that I made it a point to have my office there. So these we work areas, these places where you can have an office among other people, uh, that still allowed for those conversations. And if anything, there was some cross marketing and I got to learn what other people were doing and we developed different partnerships and ways to work together. Uh, as a matter of fact, because I officed in a space like that, I ended up finding a business partner who I continue to work with mm-hmm. today. Uh, Are you in an individual office or were you in open workspace? More like an open bullpen, right? So you walk in and there's desks and there's other things that could fit 80 different people, some grouped together, some smaller nook working areas. And my hope is most um, urban areas have something like that. I think rural loneliness, that's a whole other conversation. But I think the good news is, uh, back to your point about technology, there's so many meetup apps. I know a lot of people who don't really care for running, but are part of running groups mm-hmm. because they've found that social component GPS to be so fulfilling. Um, That's a great, the great point. Yeah. Yeah. I also think about moving our bodies. So it's one thing to like sit down and have a really deep conversation with somebody over your drink of choice. But I also think we connect differently when we're out in nature, when we're moving our bodies, be it walking or hiking or running or doing some sort of a sport. So I think yeah. about both end, right? Go give yourself some exercise, go meet some great people, laugh, have some fun, but why not give yourself two medicines instead of one? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great because the exercise becomes a little bit of a meditative state Mm -hmm. as well. We get Mm -hmm. out of our own head. We're out and about. Maybe you have, you know, if you're on a run, maybe you talk a little bit of work, maybe, but maybe not. And it's, uh, that's a great, great takeaway. I think uh, meetup.com has, some great connections. And uh, I think that's great takeaways. So I'm going to wrap it up. I, you know, if anybody what, what tell me a little bit more about your coaching, what you do and how can people reach you? Yeah. So I have a website. It's um, Oak Hill coaching 
and consulting. I'm sure we can share it maybe in a link somewhere. Um, yeah. And I think more important than me uh, drumming up business is for folks to think if coaching sounds interesting to you, find somebody local, find somebody in a familiar field or a similar background yeah. to you um, that can help you with your business. I know there's a lot of executive coaches out there, probably people in real estate and finance who have done the things many of your listeners want to do. Uh, so why not connect with that person and see how did you get where you are? Um, but also how can you kind of ask me questions to challenge me and to help me grow into the places that I want to go. So I think about coaching as walking alongside with somebody. And there are some structures where it's that consultant slash coach where like learn from some of the experiences I've had. Um, maybe to close for me, uh, some folks feel coaching is maybe a little touchy feeling. I will say it can be therapeutic. My experience having both had therapy and coaching, therapy is backwards facing and diagnostic. Coaching is forward facing uh, and curious, talking about what's possible in the future. So I know you do a lot of work with goals, Kevin. I think coaching is so helpful, creating goals, driving towards goals, helping people be accountable to those goals. So highly recommend the coaching practice in general, think it can apply to so many different industries. Yeah, that's awesome. And sometimes we don't see our blind spots and that's what a coach is for. Coach is really for helping you see those blind spots, challenge you in a, in a very healthy way. Um, you know, I, I find, you know, there's only so much you could talk to your spouse about. There's only so much you could talk to your best friend about, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, a, a coach that can really help you navigate that is important. Um, and then if you're not quite ready for coaching, that's why we're here uh, to help you break through excuses come up with strategies, just like we talked about, come up with ways to overcome those excuses, to identify the excuses first and, and overcome them. So Kevin Briarton, um, certified mortgage planning specialist here with no excuse pro podcast. We're super excited Ian, to have you on here. Um, thanks so much for everybody for listening and we will catch you on the next one. If you love this, please give us a like, on whatever podcast service you're looking at right now or listening to this on. And please share this with anybody that also wants to break through excuses. Again, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next one. And there you have it, folks. Another enlightening episode of the No Excuse Pro podcast is in the books. A heartfelt thank you to today's guests for sharing their wisdom and to you, our valued listeners, for spending your time with us. If you're ready to ditch the excuses and level up, make sure to subscribe and find all our episodes at noexcusepropodcast.com. Don't forget, the only thing standing between you and your goals is the story you tell yourself. So no excuses accepted here. Take action and make it happen.